the subject we're talking about today is the flight simulator that Captain uh, Zahari Ahmad Shah had in his basement. And it wasn't something he was shy about. He had videos about it on YouTube. But for some people, it's the definitive piece of evidence in the whole case. Yeah, it's the thing that changed people's minds. It's the thing that they used in the Netflix documentary, I think, as an anchor to say, okay, the pilot did it. Right. And the way I see it, this is sort of the remaining major elephant in the room that we need to address and talk about in detail before we get to laying out our specific theories of what happened. This is the piece of evidence that I don't know if it changed people's minds, but I think for people who already were prone to suspect that Zahari took this plane, it was really the last nail in the coffin. I think for, for a lot of people, um, I mean, particularly I'm thinking about Victor Ianella, who is a person that has been very influential in this case for a while, was really considering the possibility that this plane had been uh, hijacked through a uh, sophisticated spoofing attack. Right. But today, even though he was really the, the one who did the most to to bring forward the mathematical understanding of that spoofing attack. He himself now says, I don't think that spoof was actually executed. Um, I, I, and the two pieces of evidence that he cites are one, the debris, and two, the Zahari flight simulator. This flight was found on his flight simulator. It closely matches the, the Inmarsat data flight to the south. So it must, be, it must be correct. It's a major Rorschach test, I think, for people, because just like everything else in this mystery, you see what you want to see. And our goal here is to show everything. And then again, I keep using the word totality, but look at the totality of the mystery. So you're not just looking at one thing because it is quite easy to say like, oh, that flight simulator, that shows you did it. But yeah, you're right, Andy. These, these, these themes keep recurring in the show. One of them is that you have a tendency to perceive, you know, uh, that which, you know, comports with what you already believe. Um, but then also there, there is the necessity to see things in context. And, and another theme that we talk about is that you, things look different when you look closely. Right. So if all you know is that there was this flight simulator data that matched what authorities thought happened to the plane, it kind of seems cut and dry. But we, if you look closer and you see the granularity nuance emerges. And and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the, the, the sort of big picture about what the flight simulator data was. And then we're going to try to tease out the details about what exactly it, it said. I got to tell you, the more I looked into this, my head started to spin here. All right. So this guy, Sahari, was an accomplished pilot and he loved flying and he had been flying for what, like 30 years or something. He was one of the most senior pilots in Malaysia Airlines. And like a lot of other pilots, he had his own home flight simulator, which was better than most people's flight simulators, which is, you know, like a little computer with, with, uh, you know, a keyboard or maybe a joystick. This guy had a fairly sophisticated, but not incredibly sophisticated, but he had a, the he had a hardware, good flight simulator. I mean, the, the hardware was in, uh, the, the, com the computing power, it was a pretty normal Microsoft compatible PC, but he had it rigged up to four screens and he had like the pedals and all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I think like in terms of computation, it wasn't super sophisticated, but he had like a part of his basement dedicated to this thing. So it was clearly, and he made videos about it and put it on YouTube. So it was, it was clearly um, important to him after his plane disappeared and he had made these YouTube videos. There was no surprise that he had this thing in his basement, but the Malaysian police went and searched his house. So they were looking for evidence. Did this guy commit mass murder, suicide? Let's mm -hmm. look for notes that he wrote saying, I hate the government. I hate my wife. I want to kill everyone. They were looking for evidence. And part of the evidence they looked at was, can we find on his flight simulator hard drive flights where he did what we think he did yes. or suspect that he did? And they found one. They found one that, that some people thought was close enough to the flight into the Southern Indian Ocean. Yes, and yes, they and. found 600. They found over 600 flights, okay? Right. So he had this thing for years, and he flew it fairly often. I mean, as I was reading, I was rereading the material about this, I was thinking, if I had a flight simulator like that, how much would I use it? Yeah. Because, you know, you, you have like a fun game on your computer, but like you don't spend all your time doing it. You're a grown, he's a grown man, right? Right. 
Um, so, but he would every once in a while, he like his day off, you know, he's, he's not, he traveled a lot, obviously he's an airline pilot, but he, when he was back home and he had some time off, he would go to the basement, fire it up and like do a flight. And he, he, so he did like at least 600 that we know about just from the evidence on the, not all triple sevens. No, he had a, a DC three, he had a seven, three, seven, his, um, like his, his handle in some social media uh, applications was PBY Catalina or something like that, which is a, which is a, an amphibious airplane. And so, you know, he was flying for fun. He was using his flight simulator for fun, not so much for, for work training, because if he was going to be using it for work training, he'd probably be in a real flight simulator and not, you know, a windows 2000 Microsoft flight I mean, or whatever. I don't know. Those things aren't mutually exclusive. I mean, sometimes you might think, oh, I wonder what a, a DC three flies like. I mean, I wonder what its climb rate is. I wonder how like okay. how nimble it is. Does it does it what is its turn rate and stuff? Um, but then you might also feel like, hmm, you know, I wonder what it would what would I do if I did like if I was in Sully's situation? And what if I had like lost engine power at three thousand feet? What would that be like? Um, yeah. So you you know it, it wouldn't be a uh, I wouldn't give you a r super realistic answer, but you know if you're if you want to know like in the ballpark what it would be like, it could be fun. I'm sure he would. I could imagine him doing something like that. Out of all these files, one of them, which by the way did happen to occur about a month before the accident, showed him flying up the Malacca Strait and then turning into the Southern Indian Ocean until fuel exhaustion. Right. So. To put it in context, um, in March, he disappears. Um, the Malaysian police, you know, take his, the hard drive. There was a bunch of hard drives that were associated with his flight simulator. And they he had two different versions of flight simulator on different hard drives. So mm -hmm. I guess if he wanted to choose different, I don't know why you would do different versions. I would personally just do the best one. But anyway, he had different versions. They took them. They found all the flights. They found one flight that looked particularly suspicious. It had been carried out um, on February 2nd. He had a session where he sat down on his day off and he played for 70 minutes and he flew and he, and he did this and he did that. We don't know exactly what he did. The program doesn't record everything you do, but if you get to a point where you save it, um, or it auto saves, then there's a record left on the hard drive. And so we don't have a, 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 an exhaustive knowledge of what he did that day, but we have six data points from that session. Okay. Um, and then in his, in historical context, Mal the, the Malaysians gave this, um, information to the Australians in April. And then, but the public didn't know about it. There were rumors that were circulating. Um, a, a journalist or two dropped a hint in a, in a publication, but nobody really knew about it. And it wasn't until 2016 that these files leaked out. And I and they were leaked to me, and I published a piece in New York Magazine. And I, I went back and I reread the piece, and it was like, I wrote, like, this basically is a very damning piece of evidence that, like, puts the blame on Zahari. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how much of that was my editors and how much of me was just like anticipating that that's how my editors would want me to write it. Because right. then on my blog, like a month later, I was like, you know what, actually it's more ambiguous than that. But I hadn't had a lot of time to look at it. We just knew what the gist of the case was, which maybe we can, we can just describe like, what does it seem yeah. to say? And then we can go a little, dig a little deeper. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So, you know, the, the flight takes off from Malaysia, which is where he's from. And right, from Kuala up. Lumpur International Airport, right. which is and, his home base at yeah. Malaysia Airlines. So that alone isn't damning because that's where his home base is. It flies up the Malacca Strait, turns south, and there it goes. It doesn't well, match a lot of the other things that happened. Okay, so there's, there's six data points. The first okay. one is on the ground in Kuala Lumpur in the airport. The second one is up the Malacca Strait. The third one is further up the Malacca Strait. And then if you continue in a straight line out over the Andaman Islands, which belongs to India, this is sort of further out into the middle of the Indian Ocean, there you have the fourth one. Okay. And then it's, this, that's the fourth one. And then there's two more and they're way far south and they're, they're 45 degrees south. It's, it's deep, deep, deep remote Southern Indian Ocean. Um, so how does this look like? the last mysterious flight of MH370. It does not go east to Agari. 
It mm -hmm. doesn't do a 180 degree turn back. It doesn't fly back over Butterworth. It goes right to the part where he's flying up the Malacca Strait. So it is like MA370 only in that it goes up the Malacca Strait and then it winds up in the Southern Indian Ocean. He didn't actually sit and play this flight simulator for six hours or seven hours. Like he skipped ahead, right? A couple of people um, got the kind of computer that he had and got the flight software that he had and tried to recreate what he did. And so we looked at how does it relate to what he did? And so I did it, Victor Ianello did it. Victor and I kind of came to slightly different conclusions. Okay. Um, and I don't have a great deal of faith in my ability to decipher computer stuff. I mean, I don't. So, but this is what I, this is what I felt like I saw, okay. which is that Zahari took off from Kuala Lumpur, flew up the Malacca Strait by hand, meaning he is riding it like a bicycle. He's like putting in hand inputs yeah, and he's basically aiming in a certain direction. He's not flying from waypoint to waypoint and he's not on autopilot. Victor looked at it differently. Victor looked at it and he said, um, this guy actually, I think, was on autopilot. And I mean, what, I, I'm looking back and I'm like, why did we even argue about that? Who cares? The point is, he flew up the Malacca Strait by hand or, or on autopilot. He, he got to this um, fourth point, which is over the Andaman Sea. And then he didn't turn south per se. What he did was, as he's playing this, this program, he manually repositions the planes to the far south. So it's, right. it's sort of like he teleported the planes down yeah. to the remote ocean. I think they call that fast travel in computer games, where you don't have to actually do all the travel. You just say, this is where I want to go. Okay. I didn't know thing. that. It's fast travel. So we fast traveled down to the Southern Indian Ocean, which is interesting because... If the thesis is that the fact that, that these the, these six points suggest that he was practicing stealing the plane and flying it into the Southern Indian Ocean, like what are you practicing? Like the hard part would be this like six seconds after Rigari, you do you turn off the thing and you bank it and all this great, and then you fly over Butterworth and you're you're flying at a really high speed and like that's that's like the high tension Tom Cruise kind of action. Yeah. Um, he skips all of that. He goes to the part where I'm going to turn south. And he, I mean, what is he, what is he simulating? He's because to me, it's like the thing that he's going to do that he's never done before is, is take a plane and point it into the darkness of the night and fly over empty ocean for six hours while thinking about how he's about to die. Yeah. That's what's different. And that's, he doesn't do that. He, he takes it right down to the Southern ocean. Here's another thing that I find kind of hard to get my head around. He, when he takes it, because there, there are these two final points and they're only a few miles apart. One comes before the other. The first one, um, he's at like 35,000 feet. I forgot. I'm getting it wrong, but I think it was a little higher than that, but that's okay. 40,000 feet. It's something it's like high. that, but it was within, it was within the range of, of normal operating. I think. It's within the the Upper, ceiling of yeah. the plane. Yeah. He wasn't in space or anything. Right, right. So he's got it at this relatively high altitude. He manually positions the aircraft and he manually sets the fuel to zero. Which intriguingly, this is probably has no significance, but if you set this the fuel to zero um, on a flight simulator, it actually doesn't make the engine stop. You actually have to throttle back the engines as well. Oh, okay. But the idea being like, he the, the thing that he is simulating at this point is a plane with no engine power, like a plane that has run out of fuel or it's like ingested geese or whatever. For whatever reason, its engines don't work anymore. Yeah. And this is kind of uncanny because not only is this plane in, gone from the Malacca Straits down into the Southern Ocean, like the Marsat data suggests, the, the MH370 did, he's also out of fuel, like the Inmarset data suggests the plane was out of fuel at, on the seventh arc. So at first glance, and this is what I say when you look at it, like just at first look, it seems like this is exactly what happened to MA370. He's in the op open ocean, in the middle of nowhere with no, with no engines. And now what? So this would kind of make sense. Like, okay, now you're in this place and you have no engine power. You are doing what, the plane seems to have done. Mm -hmm. 
then there's a second point, which is kind of the same situation, but it's at 3000 feet. So it's, it's again, out of fuel, no power, and it's lower. So it seems like he was, this is what happened to the plane. Um, so I get why people think, okay, case closed. But um, why, so when you're over the ocean, especially, well, I guess they, this would have happened in the early morning, but you're over the open ocean. And to me, all open ocean is the same. Like, what does it matter if you're, if you're going to experience what it's like to put a plane down? Um, what does it matter if you're here or over there? I mean, just you, you're, you're going to, it's the, it's the surface of the ocean that you're thinking about. So I find that kind of weird. Another weird thing is that the Inmarsat data suggests that the plane, after it ran out of fuel, got pushed down into a steep and accelerating dive, basically nosedived into the ocean. So you, so you went from, we don't really know what it started at, 40,000 feet, 30,000 feet, 20,000 feet, we don't know. But it, you put the nose down and you're in the ocean, you're in the water in less than a minute. Yeah. That's not what happened here. That's not what this is showing. If you look at the speed and the, and the rate of climb, uh, it's actually close to the speed that you would fly if you're trying to glide and, to, and, 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 and get as far as you can. And it's actually going up, hmm. which, is, which is a little bit surprising. You think, okay, it has no engine power. How is it going up? Well, you can, you can actually, you know, even a glider, you yeah, know, you, go up. You, you put the nose down and you pull the, yeah, you get, the get stick speed back and, and, you, and you gain yeah, speed and yeah. you lose altitude. You gain speed, you lose altitude. Yeah. So it looks like he was practicing to glide. I mean, I guess the, the thing is, like, he could have changed his mind. I mean, he could have simulated one thing and then done something different. It could have been his v vision of this suicide mission. It could not have been. I mean, and then for the subsequent <clears throat> month, he, like, continued to do other flight simulator stuff. It wasn't even anything to do with this. Yeah. So, yeah, let's talk about the state of mind that it gets implied. Oh, the one thing I should say also is that the second, so the first point is like when the plane first ran out of fuel. The second point is it, it's not like he's now lower down and he's like diving it into the ocean. It's actually, again, he seems like he's gliding, trying to um, ex extend his, his, uh, his flight as long as he can. And I, I, you know, I said, look, this is a little bit like what um, Captain Sullenberg For experienced sure. uh, in the Miracle on the Hudson, where he hit these geese, and it wasn't because he was out of fuel, but it was because he hit these geese and his engines were broken. Yeah, and he was at about three thousand feet, and he had to figure out what to do, and he wound up ditching in the ocean. And so I thought, okay, maybe he was practicing a suicide mission, but maybe he was practicing being Sully. I mean, maybe you got, got up I, for I don't know maybe got I, up I for a like, cup of coffee, and you know came back to the computer and it was doing something different. I, I, but I, I mean, or maybe not, but I, I just, I don't know if I find any of this particularly persuasive, particularly because this was just one of his many flights. So he wasn't right. doing this so over and over and over flights. and over again. And well, it, it is unusual. I mean, listen, he did, if he did 600 flights, like one of them is going to look weird just by chance. Right. I would think so. Um, the, but and and this again, it's like there's pros and cons. Okay. In the in the column of yes, Zahari did it. Um, I would put the fact that this what this wasn't his last flight, but it was one of his last flights. It was on February second. The plane disappeared on March eighth. Um, so and he did he had done one the day before where he was flying a DC three, which I think we talked about, and then a couple weeks later he's flying a seven thirty seven. And you and I were talking about this, Andy. Uh, personally, I'm like, if you're, if you've decided to die, if you've decided to commit a terrible crime and take your own life and kill the 238 other people who have been entrusted into your hands, and then you're like playing just for fun, you're just playing for fun. That seems strange to me. I don't think someone who's, who's getting themselves ready to die 
would would enjoy, would enjoy playing a video game. It seems you think they'd be singular, singularly focused on that unless they were trying to create a diversion or something. But you know, now we're just like wildly speculating on this guy's state of mind. And in fact, we're not the only. But some people speculated not wildly on his state of mind, including you know the FBI, the Australians. I mean. You know, they, they continued to not say this guy looked like he was a mass murder suicide um, candidate. Um, a year after MH370 disappeared, I did a Kindle single um, about Andreas Lubitz, who was kind of inspired by MH370 to actually commit mass murder suicide. Yeah. We're talking about a guy who a guy who did crash a plane and had different sort of behaviors. And he had a history of mental health issues. And he had, on his computer, he had searched for um, how to like how to commit mass murder suicide, how to crash a plane. And he had searched actually Zahari Amacha. So that's not surprising. A guy who does this heinous act, like does you know, if you look at somebody's Google searches, it's like a look into their brain, right? Um, and. What's amazing is that when they looked at Zahari's hard drives, they found um, they found um, records of Google searches that he had made. Yeah. And they were all for things like, how do I fix my broken flight simulator? Yeah. I mean, this guy, he, I, I think that like, yes, this I, I do think this is probably the most damning piece of evidence against Zahari, even though I think it's flawed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the 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 fact that it is the most damning piece of evidence exists in the context of everything else which isn't damning against Sahari. You and I earlier in this show we looked at some video that he had put on YouTube of him fixing a leaky window. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people look at that and they see a guy who's sending coded messages through newspaper headlines, right? Um, to my mind, there is the fact that this is that this is the only thing that suggests Sahari did it. And that this is pretty ambiguous to me really is a story about a guy who doesn't seem to have any red flags where there's one red flag and it's like kind of a pink kind of washed out red flag. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's ridiculous to think that that flight simulator flight was his one dry run on the most complex yeah, I am. I'm saying. I'm saying that that just doesn't like. Uh, come on. No, I, I mean, he was a very good pilot, so maybe maybe he just needed one dry run to do this and had it all in his his head. But that's a that's a stretch to me. I do think if there was a session where he gets to the edge of Malaysian airspace and does a hard turn, that would be pretty damning. I think but that like, would be much yeah. less ambiguous than this. But like you said, that's the hard part. That what what he simulated in the flight simulator was the easy part: flying yeah. over the ocean, ocean, and turning off, or, you know, and cutting all the fuel. That's not the mastermind stroke here. Let me put it this way: if it turns out that Zahari did do this, we'll look at it in a whole nother light. But right. but it'll be a story in which there's a guy who just with an impeccable. Mm -hmm. emotional control set out to do something that speaks to a complete absence of humanity, total cruelty, yeah. total depravity, and presumably a really deranged and disturbed mental state. And I just want to say one more time, I, sure. I think there's just a big difference between uh, suicide and mass murder suicide. Yeah. I mean, it takes a really special kind of evil person to not just kill themselves, but to kill all those people and do it with the intention of hiding it forever. It doesn't add yeah, up. Yeah, it was me. really interesting to spend some time, you know, I actually went to Andreas Lubitz's hometown and I and I talked to some people who who knew him, who flew with him even, and um this was a guy who was he had he was it was a trajectory like the, yeah. the the ending as shocking as the ending was it like kind of lined up with where his life had been heading yeah. he was in a state of desperation he was very self-centered he was very disturbed um and i wouldn't say it made sense but it sort of it made sense within context 
and with and with Zahari Shah, you're basically positing like this guy not only did like carried out the most technically complicated and involved mass murder suicide, but also carried out a feat of mensurate uh, difficulty of just completely hiding any sign. I mean, even in the pictures of him before the flight leaves, he's looked, he looks inc- incredibly relaxed. So he had to be like a master thespian. Okay. I just want to bring up one more thing before we wrap this. Um, and cause it's something that I didn't know. It's a report and a quote from this report. It says, okay. from the file profiling analysis conducted, it is found that the exhibit MK26 was heavily used to conduct internet-related activities from 15th September 2013 until 15th March 2014. Okay, what's that last second date again? March 15th, 20, 2014, after, after the plane was... A week after the plane disappeared. <laughs> So am I so, reading this correctly, that, that someone looked at his computer and found that it was being used a week after the plane disappeared? Is his that what computer that's was being used to conduct internet activity. We don't know actually what that activity was. We do know that he had used this computer to make searches for how do I fix my flight simulator. Um, but it's a bit, you're like, wait, excuse me? Yeah, I mean, did, maybe his wife went down there and used it uh, Just, or or maybe um, there was some speculation that after the plane disappeared, like the intelligence agencies of of United States and and Russia and China, like kind of went in and, and started and planting stuff or something. To, well, more likely, like trying to figure out if he did it. OK, what report is that from? That is from the Malaysian police report, I, I believe. OK. That seems a little. It's pretty weird, weird, right? I think so. I mean, so after we started this podcast, a guy from Australia who had a flight simulator company, they had an A320 um, at an airport near Sydney, and he reached out to me and he said, I want to share you this theory that actually it's impossible. Like the flights, the, the software cannot make these six backup points. If I wanted to delve into what this guy is saying, what I need to do is find another expert who has no stake in the game and right. and ask this other person, is it true that um you know Microsoft Windows doesn't access the shadow drive, da 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 da. And then that might be worth spending more of my time and energy on it. But at this point, I feel like it's probably not worth it because I just don't think it's that probative. I think that when this mystery is solved, you go back and look at the flight simulator and you'll either conclude that it was a red herring or it was the first significant clue. I just don't think there's a whole lot more that we can say about it. It's like, you know, you know believe like it or not that he, that, he, that he flew this plane based on that data or he didn't. It's part of my ongoing project to not be a conspiracy theorist um, to good. maintain an open mind and to try to give evidence that does not fit my theory a fair hearing. And I mean, listen, I am biased. I, 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 I like you have a hard time finding this particular data set completely convincing. Um, I do feel that it is ambiguous, but people, listeners might feel otherwise. I mean, I, I invite people to weigh in and say, like, do you feel like we are underweighting right. this data? They might. They might. You, you call it the elephant in the room. This data exists. To some people, it is the smoking gun. Um, we respect their opinion. Period.